I am Dr. Rai Jayashri. A warm and hearty welcome to all the participants joining today's webinar, organized by the Department of Physics, SPW Degree and PG College, Tirupati. It's a one-day international webinar on industrial applications of ultrasonics by the resource person, Mr. Abhishek Chakrala sir from Canada, a young, dynamic and innovative researcher of this decade. <clears throat> Hope this topic will inspire all the participants, especially the researchers. So on behalf of our Department of Physics, a hearty welcome to you, sir, for this webinar. Uh, it's a... <clears throat> well, we have participants today uh, join across our state and the other parts of our nation as well. So it's an initiative webinar series due to coronavirus outbreak organized by our Department of Physics. So uh, due to this, uh, on this crisis and in this pandemic situation, we thought of how best we can engage our students uh, with the availability of uh, I mean, uh, network and technology and with the support of our TTD management. Because our TTD management is constantly encouraging uh, the educational institutions under its control in spite of uh, its, uh, I mean, uh, um, apart from its services to the pilgrims at Tirumala, the abode of Lord Venkateshwara. So it gives me a pleasure to welcome to our Devasthanam Educational Officer, Dr. Ramana Prasad sir. A hearty welcome to you, sir. I extend a warm welcome to our beloved principal ma'am, Dr. K. Mahadevamma, a sincere, simple, and good administrator of our college. Hearty welcome to you, ma'am. It's a pleasure for me, and I'm in a, a pleasure in extending a heartfelt welcome <clears throat> to all our senior retired staff of our department, uh, of our department of physics, uh, who served the department for a long time. Dr. V. Padmavati, ma'am, Mrs. V. V. Ramani, madam, V. S. Vijayalakshmi, madam, and Lakshmi Bai, and others. We have hearty welcome to all of you, ma'am. I also welcome our present HOD, Dr. C. Uma Devi, and our uh, colleagues of our department, and also the other um, uh, faculty members of our other colleges in and around Tirupati. Thank you. I, uh, once again, I welcome all of you for this uh, today's webinar. So let us start this webinar with a prayer by Dr. G. Lakshmi Sandhya, the faculty of our own department. Uh, Department of Physics, SPW degree and PG college. So over to Sandhya, please. Om Namo Venkatesaya. Yaakum Dindu Tushajaha Brahmajaha Yasubravastan Vita Ya Vina Varadanda Mandita Kara Ya Sweta Padma Sana Ya Brahma Chuta Sankara Prabhupada Bhi Devai Sata Tita Samantu Saraswati Bhagavati Nishesha Jadya Paha. Thank you. Thank you, Sandhya ma'am, for your good start of our webinar. Now, I humbly request our principal ma'am, Dr. K. Mahadevamma Garu, to address our participants of today's webinar. Madam, please. Thank you, Jayasri. Om Namo Venkatesaya. Good evening to you all. I am very happy to note that Tirumala Tirupati Devasthanam's SPW degree and PG college, Tirupati, Department of Physics is organizing a one-day international webinar on industrial applications of ultrasonics. I welcome the our resource person, Mr. Abhishek Chakrala, 
advisor of NASA Space Technology, chief design engineer, and our Devasthanam educational officer, R. Ramana Prasad Garu, and Dr. C. Ramadevi, Uma Devi, HOD, other faculty members of the Department of Physics, and all the academicians participants. I am delighted to say that the Department of Physics, SPW degree and PG college has initiated one day international webinar on industrial applications of ultrasonics during the COVID-19 pandemic situation. This is a very good beginning towards adapting advanced teaching methodologies, virtual classrooms and various e-platforms which is a novel approach to teaching and learning process, especially when the learners are forcibly stay at home. Apart from Srivari Seva, Tirmala Tirupati Devasthanams has established educational institutions from KG to PG level to impart values among students and expose them to Vedic knowledge. The Tirmala Tirupat Devasthanam's management is determined to cater to the needs of the students and ensure them overall development, positive attitude, and employability. This pandemic has thrown open a plethora of challenges to shift from conventional methods to teaching and digital learning. I wish the webinar a grand success and thanks to the resource person, Mr. Abhishek Chakrala for accepting to be the resource person of this webinar. Thank you one and all. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much for your good wishes bestowed on our department and also an inspiring message to all our participants of today's webinar. Dr. D. Uma Manshari, faculty from our department, will share a few lines about our college. Dr. Uma Maheshwari, please, are you on the line? Uma Maheshwari? You may continue, ma'am. Hello? Ma'am, you may continue. I think she has a network issue. Okay. Okay, sir. Basically, you go through the proceedings. You just go through the concepts of our college. You just do it. Okay. So, <clears throat> it gives me an immense pleasure to say about a few words about our college. <clears throat> We have to grow from the uh, inside out. Sorry. If you educate men, you will educate but one. But if you educate women, you will educate a nation. With this great quotes of Mahatma Gandhiji, Sri Padmavati Women's Degree College was established in the year 1952 by the Tirumala Tirupati Devasthanas. The vision and mission of our SPW degree and PG college is to serve the educational needs of women students to inculcate spiritual and moral values among the girl students. To make them responsible future citizens of India. Our college was brought under the affiliation to SP University in the year 1956. The college which had eight teachers and 35 students at the time of its inauguration on 11th August 1952 has over these years emerged as a premier women institute in Andhra Pradesh with about 40 faculty members, uh, uh, sorry, almost around 100 faculty members in offering their knowledge to more than um, uh, 3,000 students in as many as 25 subjects of study. The college endeavors to offer education even to those who lack the financial resources. Co-curricular activities are uh, encouraged 
to ensure comprehensive development of the students and many extra co curricular activities are conducted to ensure their social involvement so with this few lines of about our college i request our uh, hod dr c umadevi madam to say a few lines about our department please thank umadevi madam thank you jayasree it gives me an immense pleasure to say a few words about the department of physics spw degree and pc college tirupati let me start with the great words of swami vivekananda who said you have to grow from the inside out none can teach you none can make you spiritual the, there is no other teacher but your own soul these words are inspiration to us the department established in the year 1952 and our department constantly encourages the students and gives momentum in achieving their goals both in magnitude and direction the senior members of the staff of the department though retired from their services still encourage us in our efforts to maintain the legacy of the department in to to a progressive way among them dr v padmavati garu a simple woman served the department as hod for a long period she retired as a principal of sri venkateswara arts college ttd tirupati next mrs v v ramani garu a good teacher and an able administrator also discharged her duties in our department she also became the principal of our college and retired in the year 2018 with their efforts only our department started msc physics a post graduation course in the year 2010 the other senior faculty of the department mrs kameswari garu mrs sekuntala garu mrs prabhavati garu mrs v s vijayalakshmi garu and mrs lakshmi bai garu also put their efforts for the progress of the department to reach greater heights all their services are highly appreciable and they are still encouraging us in exponentially increasing the growth of our department with the constant support from the ttd management principals from the beginning to the present and senior members of the staff we are continuously organizing many programs like seminars competitions and science exhibitions every year to follow the footsteps of dr apj abdul kalam garu who rightly said all of us do not have equal talent but all of us have an equal opportunity to develop our talents we are really proud to say that many of our students received pratibha awards to their outstanding performances in sri venkateswara university examinations every year our students actively participate in seminars Re, uh, conferences international and national and summer research fellowships and physics tra talent training search programs sponsored by many great institutions like iisc iits etc across the country in addition to this our students are interestingly participate in many activities like national wide youth festivals playing skits related to physics in national science day celebrations and other programs conducted by vellur institute of technology in 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 accordance with the national science day celebrations we are very proud to say that they bagged many prizes and get appreciation to our department of physics with the brief note i request dr jayasree to continue the proceedings thank you for giving me this opportunity thank you one and all thank you madam thank you very much for your brief report on our department i request dr g lakshmi sandhya to introduce our today's resource person of this webinar mr abhishek chakrala sir before that a small announcement and request to all our participants that <coughs> we are running a live question and answer session at the end of this webinar so we enable that feature also so it is it is on your right hand side of your screen 
so i request all the participants that you have any questions please pop them in there and if you don't uh, if you miss anything uh, you don't worry we'll be sending uh, around on demand uh, i mean uh, on demand recording uh, when it is available to us so i once again welcome all the participants and also i thank each and every participant uh, for taking time out and being with us for this webinar today thank you thank you very much so i request dr lakshmi sandhya to introduce our uh, resource person it gives me an immense pleasure to introduce our today's resource person mr abhishek chakrala sir good evening sir mr abhishek chakrala a 26 year old electrical engineer a advisor of nasa tech transfer program born in the holy temple town at the feet of lord venkateshwara tirupati mr abhishek chakrala while pursuing his engineering degree received the best researcher of india award for his contributions on telemetry and tracking systems for mars orbiter mission by the indian space agency isro he is also worked as research engineer in defense research development organization of india that is drdo mr abhishek is honored by the cognizant technology solution as the best strategic advisor abhishek chakrala a university of windsor master student engineering was a part of a seven member team that won 2500 dollar prize in one category by using a nasa innovation to track weather the team was named a finalist in the us space race startup challenge where it pinched an idea to make electricity using a kite in remote locations abhishek chakrala entered the competition on his own and led a success story in nasa he was a winner of nasa space race challenge where he got commercialization rights to commercialize two nasa patents to his credit he also got a special recognition from european space agency for his contributions in managing global waste using gps he is working with the ministry of information technology and agricultural both with governments of india and usa on developing high business solutions through artificial intelligence blockchain in agriculture industry he is also chief innovative officer of agritenx a blockchain based agricultural platform that can leverage the potential of rural economy he is also working as the chief design engineer in tesonix technical advisor for global blockchain foundation executive vice president for greenster he is serving as a judge for world blockchain freedom from cancer startup challenge scale challenge neuro startup challenges now he is also serving as an advisor for eight well established established startups and four startup acceleration in canada today we are happy to have such a young and dynamic man as our resource person to deliver the lecture on industry applications of ultrasonics hope this will inspire our students both uc and pc and all other participants thank you thank you sandhya so with a due respect i hand over this session to our resource person mr abhishek chakrala sir so please i request you to proceed with this lecture Hello everyone uh, thank you so much for the warm um, welcome and i thank everyone for organizing this webinar uh, so as everyone said like i have been uh, working with different agencies for a longer period of time and i especially thank spw college for inviting me as a research person and i would i would like to thank 
uh, principal madam and J3 and all the physics department for organizing this wonderful webinar. And let's quickly move on to the topic, not wasting the time. So here we go. Like uh, right now we are focusing on uh, industrial application of ultrasonics. As, as you guys might know, like most of the things today are based on ultrasonics. And this is not a new word to the existing people because this is the existing thing that has been going on for a long period of times. And this ultrasonics is not a new and it's existing. So let's get on to what's actually an ultrasonic wave. Basically ultrasonic waves are nothing but sound waves with a different audible frequency. And these specific waves are, couldn't be able to hear by humans because the frequency of these are upper than the normal audible limit of a human hearing. And here we can, here we go to see like what exactly the spectrum of an ultra of a normal sound looks like. So basically, the frequencies that are below 20 hertz are considered as infrasound, and the frequencies that are in between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz are considered as acoustic, uh, which are also known as normal uh, audible uh, hearings, and then. The other things is called as ultrasonics, which range from 20 kilohertz to anywhere between 200 megahertz. And these waves, uh, as I'm talking about the waves, waves are two forms, as everyone knows. One is a longitudinal wave, which is created by mechanical vibrations, and the other is a transverse wave, which are created by electromagnetic radiations. So most people know that most of the waves that we see in day-to-day -day life are transverse waves, which means you can consider the waves that are emitting from the light. Those are called as transverse waves. And all the electromagnetic spectrum, which includes your rainbow and everything that is emitting from sun, these are also known as, are, are the part of electromagnetic spectrum, which means these are transverse in nature and the properties of, are different. And when you come to the ultrasonic waves, these waves are specifically uh, longitudinal waves, which means longitudinal waves are the waves which are created by vibrations in the air. So here you can, here you can see like how an actual longitudinal wave looks like. So these waves are similar to the, that of the waves that you can create using a vibrating fork, which can produce an audible frequency or audible sound. So whenever a disturbance occurs in the matter, these matter pulls on to the atoms that are nearby in the medium, which create disturbances in the medium, thereby creating waves in the medium. So these are known as longitudinal waves. And as I'm talking about the different wave structures, longitudinal waves comprises of rate fractions and compressions. So here you can see how the wave pattern goes when a disturbance occurs in the medium. And here you can see the pro prospective compressions and rate fractions, which, are, which can be used for analyzing different data. And uh, these are part of uh, sound spectrum. So there is no difference in the physiological properties with sound. So basically ultrasound is similar to that of a sound, but the only difference with the ultrasonic wave is these ultrasonic frequencies you couldn't able to hear. And let's move on to the different physiological properties of ultrasonic waves. As, as you know, like every element in the physics is considered to have certain physical properties. And uh, the major property that you need to consider for any of the physical structure is velocity. So velocity, uh, what does velocity mean? Velocity is nothing but uh, how fast, it, it's also known as like the speed in which a wave or whatever the segment will be transfers into the medium. So basically a velocity of ultrasound shows how fast a sound wave can travel through a material. So these velocities depend on several other factors as you can see in here mostly the velocity of a wave or of an ultrasound depends on the mechanical properties of the medium that it transfers into. Because in the previous slide, I have shown you how the wave can be generated and this wave generation and movement of atoms from, from a single perspective to the different position depends on the elasticity of the medium and also on the density of the medium. Yeah, right. Let's so, 
So in fact, in fact, aluminum has the highest velocity so far. Uh, the velocity of aluminum is close to like 6,320 meters per second. And here is the different uh, velocities for different materials, like, uh, like how the ultrasound travels in water and tin, stainless steel, silver, cast iron, and polystyrene. And as we are talking about the other major parameter that we need to consider during the propagation or during the development or a physiological study of any property, that's frequency. The frequency is nothing but uh, frequency is nothing but how an actual particle vibrates in a medium. So frequency of ultrasound is at a rate which the particles vibrate in the medium when a disturbance is created. Normally frequency is measured for in oscillations per second or which are obviously known as hertz. Here you can see the particle uh, in the wave nature when the particle starts at t equal to zero and it travels through all the way and reaches at t equal to 10, you can see the free, how many times the particle has been vibrating along this distance part. And this sort of frequency calculation is very helpful in ultrasonics in order to make sure the penetration capacity of the signal is high. And the other thing that we need to consider in terms of uh, wave propagation is amplitude. So amplitude is nothing but the range of and the strength of the signal. So I, I hope most of you guys might have known about amplitude, but amplitude in here in a wave can be represented in here, which means the, the maximum strength of the wave. So it, it also depends on the different mediums on the propagation where a wave passes through it. But uh, if you consider in a CRO, like a cathode ray oscilloscope, and if you project a sine wave into the CRO, then you can clearly see how the amplitude varies and what's the impact of amplitude on the wave propagation. So that's a brief about how ultrasonic wave and what or the properties of it. And now let's move on how we can generate ultrasonic waves. So you might have a lot of questions going on in your mind so far, because when I said the word that ultrasound is nothing but sound, then there will be a number of questions that are arising in your mind saying that, uh, why, why, can't you, why can't we generate an ultrasound like using a normal tuning fork? Yeah, whatever you think is absolutely right. But the thing is, as I mentioned to you, ultrasound has a different specified frequency. And whatever the sound or whatever the vibrations that you can generate using a normal tuning fork or whatever the substance might be has a different frequency. Which means in order to generate ultrasonic wave, you need to create disturbances in an object which can equally produce the amount of frequency that is required for an ultrasonic wave. For this purpose, you couldn't able to generate ultrasonic waves using a tuning fork or any other substances. For this, we used a normal well-known effect cause called as piezoelectric effect. So basically most of the ultrasonic waves are generated using piezoelectric materials. So basically these are a different sort of materials which have asymmetric crystal structure. And when you apply pressure to these crystals, they create electricity. And when you apply electricity to these crystals, they create vibrations. And obviously the frequency of the wave depends on the property and thickness of the piezoelectric material too. In the next slides, I'm going to go in deep into the atomic level to see how a piezoelectric crystal actually works and what causes the piezoelectric crystal to generate vibrations. So here, this is a simple uh, overview of how you can generate uh, uh, sound waves and as well as electricity waves. And here, if you can see here, when electricity is applied to these plates, which are known as piezoelectric plates, and the substance in between these plates is piezoelectric material. 
So what happens? So when you apply electricity to these two plates, these plates create a certain amount of vibration, which in fact causes the gen generation of ultrasonic waves. And this effect is known as inverse piezoelectric effect. And the one that you can see on here is is vice versa of the effect, which means if this material receives any sort of vibrations from external environments, which are equivalent to the received frequency, then this metal generates voltage. This is called direct piezoelectric effect. And here you can see how a piezoelectric strip can oscillate when equivalent amount of electricity is passed to the strip. So this specific thing is also called as a transducer because transducer is a device which convert electrical signals into mechanical form and mechanical signals into electrical form. Now let's go on and see how this piezoelectric crystal actually works and what made, it what made this crystal different from the rest of the objects and how only this specific crystals can create ultrasonics. So if here, if you see the structure, this is the lattice structure of calcium titanate, which is commonly used and um, other than quartz. So basically most of the elements that we see today have atoms and molecules, and they do have different terminologies, they do have different structures. And if you see this specific crystal, it's a part of piezoelectric family, which means not all the crystals that are existing today are piezoelectric materials. Only few of the crystals exhibit piezoelectric properties. And there are few man-made crystals that are specifically tuned to generate ultrasonics or make them as piezoelectric acts. And here, I'm taking a simple lattice structure of calcium titanate where you can see how the molecules are distributed in a single unit cell. Here you can see the calcium ions are distributed on the outer of the lattice and the oxygen atoms are distributed inside the lattice and there is a single titanium ion that is sitting inside the lattice. So if you can see each and every ion has a charge. And in here, the charge is always represented by the valency number. And uh, however, the atoms are, are, are the electrons occupied in the outer layers of the molecule. So this is a normal piezoelectric material structure, which means it's not symmetrical. Symmetrical means all the charges are in the different positions but even though these charges are in different positions, if you tilt or if you rotate the crystal, the, say, the, the position of the charges won't change, which means for instance, if there is a positive charge in here and positive charge in here and negative in here and negative in here, if you tilt it or if you rotate it or if you do any manipulations to the structure, positive re will remain in here, positive will remain in here because these are symmetrical in nature. But in order to generate or in order to get a piezoelectric effect, this crystal structure must not be symmetrical, which means it should be asymmetrical. So only it is possible to generate or create piezoelectric effect in these form of crystals. So here you, you see the uh, normal structure and here I'm, I'm applying a different voltage to this specific structure. And here you can see how, when I apply an voltage to the specific structure, you can see the movement of this titanium ion from center changes from here to here, which is causing a deformation of the crystal structure, thereby creating vibrations internally in a crystal. Here you can see how actually these charges are concentrated or focused to the specific point and how the deformation occurs when an electricity is applied. So this specific titanium ion tends to excite its state because it got an additional external energy in the form of electricity, thereby absorbing few electrons 
and exciting to the excited state in here. And only these sort of materials are capable of generating uh, vibrations. The best example that you can see in the electronics industry is quartz crystal. So this specific quartz crystal is also a piezoelectric material. Now let's move on to see how these ultrasonics are applicable in NDT. So NDT is not a foreign term or it's not a different terminology. It's a, a standard terminology that is used in industries. NDT means non-destructive testing. As the name clearly indicates that, the that this is a specific testing which is done by not destructing the parts or the substance. So basically, uh, basically non-destructive testing is an analysis which is used by most of the industries to evaluate and study the properties of a material or a structure. And mostly these non-destructive testing techniques are used in welding industry in huge. So when I'm talking about welding, there are different sorts of welding you can see in your day-to-day -day life. All the objects that you see in your day-to-day -day life are are mechanical objects and they need weldings, they need different sort of coatings, they need different sort of uh, like operations. So it's very common that you see your day-to-day -day parts are each and everything is a part of a mechanical operation. And here you can see the spot welding. So what does spot welding mean? So basically the ones that we see in your day-to-day -day life are when you go out and look into the normal uh, auto building shops, there you can see the welding, which is known as arc welding. And that's a different sort of welding. And the one that we are mostly talking about today is spot welding. So spot welding is nothing but applying a higher currents to the materials or to the substance in here so that it can weld itself. So basically what happens in the spot welding is spot welding has two electrodes. And in between these two electrodes, two metal strips or the metal which we wanna do welding is kept in between these two electrodes. And a high current is passed through these electrodes. As everyone knows, electricity generates heat. And if excess amount of heat is generated, a metal melts. And when a metal is melt, these two electrodes are pressed together, forming a joint in here, thereby creating a welding of these two parts. Typically, a spot weld looks similar to that of this, this, this. And spot welding today is very predominant. And you can see it in most of the cars, most of the aerospace structures, most of the civil structures, and most of the complex cars or railway systems. Here, a simple door, which you even won't think of how many wells it has. The tiny little spots that you see in here are spot wells. And this is how a spot well looks, and this is how a destructive testing is done in here. So I'll... Sh I'll let you walk through how these ultrasonics had a very, very good impact in the non-destructive testing industry. So consider, consider a simple weld on a door of a car. So, so if you wanna test the quality of the weld, which is obviously important because you don't want your doors or you don't want your car panel to break in while you're going on highways with more than 100 kilometers per hour. So in order to do that, most of the automotive manufacturers follow the non-destructive testing. So in a typical car, there are 3,000 to 4,000 spot welds, which means all the points that you see in here, not the holes, but all the tiny little points, joints that you see in here are actually spot welds. And imagine a manufacturing industry not performing non-destructive testing and performing non-destructive testing for all the cars that they manufacture. 
to be frank, you won't even have a car to travel if they do a destructive testing. Destructive testing means they want to tear down this well to see if it actually welded the part or not. So even as per the quality standards, if they do a car in the batch of 10 or in a batch of 100, it takes forever to rip off and tear all the wells to see what, to see the quality of the wells. So for this specific reason, most of the industries follow non-destructive testing because it makes their life easier and they can easily navigate through the specific weld and follow the quality of it. And while I was talking to you about uh, the non-destructive testing, there are two standard methods that industry follows. One is mechanical method and the other one is electronic scanning method. So mechanical scanning method is nothing but sending a transducer phased array element on the nugget we call all the welded point all the way through so that it scans each and every line of the weld. So basically this method has a lot of uh, pros and cons as every method has and it's a time taking and time consuming process. So most of the industries follow the other method which is called as electronic uh, scanning where the transducer that we have been showing has different elements and each and every element can focus on the weld so that they can get the desired quality or desired, they can perform desired operations on each and every element of the weld. So here is a simple setup to show how actually a non-destructive technique works. So here, the thing that you see in a tiny little box is called as cathode ray oscilloscope or oscilloscope. And basically what this does is it measures and it can be used to track or see any sort of signals. And here you see the specimen, which is, which is the test sample. And this test sample needs to be quality checked. So for this purpose, we are using this specific uh, non-destructive testing purpose, which has a probe. This probe is a transducer, you can call it. And this is the one that generates ultrasonic waves. And here you can see coupling agent. A lot of people might think, oh, what's coupling agent? Uh, or what is it? why is it necessary? So coupling agent is nothing but a gel that is applied on top of the specimen. And while I was talking to you about gel, most of the, most of the people that are listening to this webinar might have gone through like medical scans or ultrasound scans. So even when you go to a specific uh, ultrasound facility, they do apply a little bit of gel on top of your body. So what does this gel does? This gel is a coupling gel because um, this gel is a coupling gel that actually reduces the attenuation of the ultrasonic signal. As I previously mentioned that ultrasonic waves are mechanical waves. And these mechanical waves travel through mediums and the intensity or the signal strength of the ultrasonic wave depend on the medium. So consider an ultrasonic wave generating from a probe and passing through a different medium, which is aluminum. There will be a little bit of attenuation when the wave travels from this medium to this medium. In order to compensate that signal attenuation, coupling agents are widely used. These coupling agents are made with substances like glycerin or combination of glycerin and water, or there are a lot of other water soluble uh, solvents which can be used as a coupling agents. And when you generate or when you pulse ultrasonic through the probe, so this is what you can see in the scope. So this is an input echo, which where it shows how the ultrasonic wave is generated and where it is passed. 
And this is a fly echo where you can only see if there is any flaw in the weld. And the, the thing that you see here is a back wall echo is echo which is paused all the way through here and got reflected at the back wall. I'm sure this is an actual picture of a transducer. So here, whatever I have shown is just a phys physiological assumption just to make sure how a non-destructive process works and what is the process flow. This specific thing is, a tr is called as a transducer, which is obviously known to generate ultrasonic wave, which means it is a piezoelectric material. And here you, you can see it has a different uh, like shape. So this shape constitutes, if you, if you observe this material in the microscopic level, you see that matrix are really like this. So this is a part of electrical scanning. As I previously mentioned that in electrical scanning, mostly the non-destructive testing or the propagation is done through element analysis. So in this transducer, you have 52 elements, which means each and every element here is a part of piezoelectric material. And each and every element in here is capable of producing ultrasonic wave. And here we have a brief overview on how actual pulsing into the metal works. Here you can see that this is the transducer and this is the specimen, which is the metal that you are going to pulse an ultrasonic echo. So when the signal is generated here, you can see the retrospective waveform and waveform of the signal. So this specific thing is the amplitude of the signal, as you can clearly see. And the wave started from this transducer and it is propagating. So when the wave propagates, here you can see there is no like distortion or anything or any uh, like interference or anything in when it's passing through because it's going through this specific coupling agent. And when it hits the metal, you can see, as you know, like whenever a wave or whenever a propagation hits an obstacle, obviously certain percent of energy will be absorbed by the obstacle. Not only that, certain percent of uh, energy will be processed through the plate. And in here, when the echo hits or when the ultrasound hits the first layer of the metal, certain part of the ultrasound wave is reflected and certain part of ultrasound wave is passed through the material. And here you can clearly see uh, the reflection, the reflected wave font in here. And it has not only single reflection, it has multiple reflections. And you can see all the reflections that they're doing here. In the next slides, I'm gonna show you how actually echo processing works and how many internal reflections takes place in each and every specimen. So here is the reflection that looks like in welded parts. So here, as you see, this is the transducer, which means the matrix element A and matrix element B. So each matrix element, as I said previously, is capable of generating ultrasonic wave. So let's get on to uh, study how the wave looks like on element A. So this element generated ultrasonic wave and it's passed through the specimen. And then here, the, the color in blue is a coupling agent, you can see. And here are the respective graph forms of the specific signal. So when, when the signal is generated and it's passed through the material, certain percent of the wave is reflected from here. As you can clearly see, it's the surface reflection. And certain part of wave is passed through the material. You can see it's passing through the material. And here, whenever the internal reflection happens or the surface reflection happens, you can see a difference in the waveform right here, which means it constitutes the surface reflection. 
and then this processed wave goes on multiple reflections multiple reflections because this part is not welded yet so this is a specific metal piece let us call it metal piece one and metal piece two so here there is no weld or there is no connection in between these two metals so that's why this specific ultrasound wave reflected, 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 and it does n number of multiple reflections depending upon the signal strength. And here, if you consider matrix B or element B, and here you can see the welded position that's actually uniting these two metals. So even in here, the same thing occurs so there is one and here the interface reflection won't you can't you won't see the interface reflection because there is a welded position in here which means it's actually a metal and it's passing through the welded position and if for instance if there is any air gap or any flaw in this specific weld because air gap in the air gap, the medium is different air so there will be an internal interface reflection from here where which you can obviously see in the form of gate in the form of this uh, distortion in the signal in here but in this case as there is no airflow or air gap or anything the signal passes through the metal and it passes through the weld and it continues the reflection on the other side this is called as back wall reflection and it again constitutes like this, each and every element in a transducer shoots the ultrasonic pulse into the specimens. And here we can have a quick look on how the echo processes in the ultrasound. So as I said, this is the incoming wave, which is obviously generated by the ultrasound uh, probe or the transducer, and it passes through the metal. So first, it's this first surface in uh, reflection where you can see. And then it passes through, passes through the joint or the interface in here because the, this is a welded part. And it goes on through and it goes to the backside of the metal plate too, and it gets reflected. And as this first reflection from the surface, it won't stop at this point and it continues continues, continues, it's similar to that of like a TAR principle, total internal reflection. And, it, and the reflection continues, continues as long as the signal strength is uh, up to the specified level. And there is a lot of doubts on from people on how you can actually take or analyze a well sample, even though the echo processing or whatever the wave structure does. For that, there is a principle that has been existing from like thousands of years that every body in the universe is capable of absorbing certain amount of energy. And based on the energy absorption technique, you can actually say what's the material of the object or how far the object is. So this principle is applicable everywhere else, like in radar, in sonar, in remote sensing and everything. So in, even in the non-destructive testing, we are going to apply the same sort of principle, energy distribution and absorption that makes our life more easier to think on what material is it, whether there is any flaw or whether the material is good. So here, as you can see, the transducer generated the signal and it's, it is passing through, let us say, an, another component called a polystyrene. So when the signal is generated and it, it's passing through a material, there won't be certain amount of attenuation because it just, the sound has been created. And this polystyrene is a part of transducer upper element, which means the copper structure that you see on the transducer that I've shown to you before, it's actually the polystyrene. So the material generates, the piezoelectric material generates the signal and it's passing through the uh, surface of the actual transducer. So there is no uh, reflection or anything. But when this specific signal hits the ultrasonic gel, which is also called a scoop gel, the medium differs. 
And this specific ultrasonic gel or coupling agent absorbs certain percent of energy or reflects certain percent of energy and passes through certain percent of energy. And then this specific uh, wave that has been less than whatever the signal strength that has been generated passes through the material steel. Steel absorbs certain percent of energy or reflects certain percent of energy and absorbs certain percent of energy. And it goes on like, this is like for matrix A, for matrix B or for matrix C and everything. So this energy absorption technique can be used for us to create a simple picture to show where exactly the, uh, the welding happened and whether there are any flaws or cracks in the material. So here, uh, this algorithm is developed by us in order to assess or make people's life easy to see how a welded part looks like. So this is a typical weld where you can see these two metal plates are welded together. And if you do, if you perform the non-destructive testing using the algorithm that we tell that, it shows the size of the bulb. It shows if the weld is if large enough or if it shows if the weld is small or if it shows whether there is any crack or anything in the weld, which makes most of the industrial life easy because they can store this information, they can use it for their future data processing. Not only that, they can easily complete their quality assessments or well quality checks. And you might ask a question, how this entire thing works and what's the basic electronics behind this? So basically any sort of signal processing is done through a digital signal processing board, which actually takes the signal and process the signal if it's in an analog form or if it's in digital form, uh, it processes the signals and it gives you an accurate values. So here in this sort of specific uh, setup, so normally a transducer will be collected, will be connected to a multiplexer. In, uh, as you can see in here, and this entire setup, we call it as a DSP board or we call it as a digital signal processing board. So basically what happens is an interrupt from a computer or from a central processing unit sends a request to the digital signal processing board. And this digital signal processing board is capable of processing the applications or the signals. And whenever the transducer collects or sends a specific signal, all these signals needs to be go through the multiplexer. And this multiplexer, as you know, this multiplexing, uh, it does the multiplexing technique, which makes the signal processing easier. And here you can see different elements like pulsar receiver. The pulsar is the one that actually shoots the pulse. So whenever the central processing unit receives a, an interrupt or signal, this digital signal processor board initiates the ADC. And also it initiates the pulsar to send or to shoot a pulse to the multiplexer. So as you know, multiplexing means a single signal gets split into different multiples. So here you can't do, you can't send a signal to each and every element. If you do that, then the, then the width of the wire or the width of the transducer will be too bulky. So for this purpose, what we did is like, we use a pulsar and we use a multiplexer. So if the pulsar initiates the signal, the multiplexer gets the signal and the multiplexer shoots this signal into for the 52 channels, which means this is a one to 52 channel multiplexer. And through this multiplexer, each and every matrix or each and every element of the matrix gets the signal or gets the ultrasonic pulse or the electrical pulse and which generates the ultrasonic signal. And the same happens uh, in the reverse direction. Actually, this is uh, multiplexer come demultiplexer. So 
when you shoot the signal, this specific transducer is active. It shoots out the pulse to the specimen. And also this specific transducer should be capable of receiving the reflected pulse as well. Because there is, there won't be any use if the transducer only receive or send shoots the signal and it won't receive anything. For this, these 52 channels are equally capable of receiving the uh, emitted signals as well. So once this signal is shooted into the air or shooted into the specimen, the reflections happen and the reflected signals are again captured by these things, which are processed through the demultiplexer and then go on to the receiver, which means this is the pulsar and receiver, which means this pulsar shoots the signal and this receiver receives the back echo back echoes or reflected signals from the surface uh, interference and interactions. And all these received signals are processed to ADC, which is called as analog to digital converter. Because whatever the signal that is generated by these transducers, they are not digital signals. They are analog signals. And it's very hard to process uh, analog signals nowadays because everyone likes to see their processing in like computers and other things. So every electronic device in today's industry has an ADC. They call it as analog to digital converter. So this specific thing converts all the analog signals to digital formats where you can clearly see the signal here is a sinusoidal signal. And this signal has been decrypted or converted to the binaries where you can see it in the digital format. And then this signal or this digital signal is processed in this digital signal processing board where you can see these pictures. And here I'm gonna show you how actually our algorithm processes the signals and converts this into the uh, picture. Here you can see there are you can see three different colors in here. One is white, the thick white line, and a green gated line, and an ash, ash or gray line in here. So this specific thing is similar to that of what we have we have seen in the previous overview setup with an oscilloscope. So this is the pulse that has been generated by the transducer. And this gated area here shows the internal reflection or the interface. <clears throat> and this white signal is for the selected channel, which means, as I said, we have like 52 channels and 52 elements in here. So you can select each and every element. And here, this thickness, this specific number in here shows the thickness because it's, this, it's again the same principle of energy absorption. And uh, it, it, it's the same principle as the sonar and radar too, where you shoot a pulse, you know the, trans, you know the transmitted pulse time and you know the reflected pulse time. And based on this, you can easily calculate how much amount of distance has this specific signal travel. As we all know, um, like uh, the, the speed of the sound and it's very easy for us to process the distance. So this is the basic principle that we use for measuring the thickness. And here all the gray channels that you see are actually the consolidated a signal from all the 52 channels so that it shows the actual signal strength of the actual transducer and the probe. So based on this, we developed an algorithm that shows a picture similar to this, which means if the fusion happens, you can see it in a green color. And again, this entire thing is developed on energy absorption principle. And here you can see that the red or the orange fusion right here, it shows there is no weld or there is no fusion happened on the specimen. And here is a brief video on how our platform works. 
So basically, this is the metal that we want to do. Let us say this is uh, like NDT. So this is the unit or this is the algorithm. This can be applicable to any unit. So basically, when, when you see this and you need to apply an ultrasonic couplant on top of it just to make sure the signal passes through and the attenuation won't happen. And this probe, when you keep the probe on the specific specimen and hit the setup, it actually performs the setup, which means this, it performs the setup just to make sure the thickness of the material. And it also analyzes. it does a pre-setup about the structure, about the composition of the material and other things so that this data will be useful for us to process for the next of the steps. And when you actually keep it on the welded position right here, and if when you hit the get button, you can actually see what the, actually see the welded fusion in here. So this is basically shows like how the weld has been done in here and uh, what's the, it even shows the nugget size, we call it. Uh, normally nugget size is the size where the fusion happens. And it also shows the depth of the indentation of the weld, which means like how deep is the weld and what's the diameter of the weld. So technologies like this has been created a lot of vast impact in the non-destructive testings because there are a lot of advantages for these sort of techniques where actually it, it can be used to save a lot of uh, pry tests or destructive testing. And also it can be used to reduce a lot of scrap where most of the people does, and it has low production cost. And it's, it's this specific technology is running all over the world right now. And now let's move on to another topic that we'll be discussing today, just to give you guys an overview on how ultrasonic wireless power transmission works. <clears throat> I know like most of the people nowadays in the modern world are very much excited about the wireless power. So here we'll see like what's actually a wireless power. Wireless power is nothing but a transmission of an electric electricity without using wires or without using a physical link. As you all know, like movement of electrons from one part to other part constitutes current electricity. And in order to transfer electricity from one place to other, you need a medium to pass through. And this specific traditional method has been existing from a longer period of time since Nikola uh, like found his Tesla coil and since the electron has been invented. But as we are in the modern era, we are fully focusing on wireless power. And here is how an overview of wireless energy transfer looks like. So most of the techniques today, right now in the world are based on two things. One is like near field and far field. And when I'm talking about an electromagnet or like wireless power transfer, today, most of the gadgets that you see in your day-to-day -day life which might include wireless charging pad for your phone or wireless charging earphones or whatever, they are mostly work on electromagnetic induction principle because these are only meant to work for near field. And when you move on to the other level of transmitting the power actually from the power generation station to the substations in different parts of the cities, then you can see these few techniques that are microwave power wireless transmission and laser power wireless transmission. So most of the gadgets for are near field because you don't want to trans you don't want to charge your cell phone from your home sitting in your office. So that's why they go for the near field and this one works on the electromagnetic induction principle. So basically um, here we have a power source or supplier and this power source or supplier is hooked to a transmitter. Obviously this has an internal circuit, circuitry for other purposes. 
And this transmitter is then connected to a coil. And as you know, like whenever the same, uh, like whenever electricity passes through the coil, it creates a magnetic field. And this magnetic field can be induced in any other coil with the same number of turns provided with the same resonant frequency. And this is how a normal wireless power transfer works from a coil to coil. Here, there, there is no medium, which means no physical medium like a uh, wire or anything. Instead, air acts as a medium and it passes through and it sends to the receiver, where receiver has again other circuitry uh, to just amplify or deamplify or to rectify any noise. And then it's given to the load. This is how an actual setup of wireless power transfer works if you have a wireless hub at your home. So here you can directly give your power from your outlets to the circuit screen here or to the device, which has a transmitter and it transfers through the magnetic field and it receives and you can obviously supply your power to the fan without you having the wires. How cool is that? And the other one that we are talking about is the microwave wireless power transmission. So which means in here, the, the waves are transmitted to the distance place using microwave principle. As everyone knows, microwave is one of the strongest uh, wave in the electromagnetic spectrum with higher frequencies and it, and it is used in radar and other uh, like high intensity principles or high intensity devices where it can penetrate a lot through the different other structures. So, so here the AC source will be created, uh, which is uh, your normal power supply from your wall outlet. And it will be given to a microwave generatory circuit where this AC signals or AC power is transferred into the equivalent amount of microwave with equivalent amount of intensity. And this is given to an amplifier just to amplify the signal so that the signal can transfer through long distances. And is given to the receiver and the receiver or to the transmitter and the transmitter sends these in the form of a normal antenna and the wave propagates through the normal ear medium and receives at the receiver and then processes it. To the rectifier and you can use it to different other devices or gadgets or whatever it might be. There are even though there are a lot of existing technologies for the wireless power transfer, nothing is predominantly used widely in the industries because <clears throat> most of these technologies in white in the present scenario uses electromagnetic induction or uses electromagnetic spectrum for for some reason to uh, propagate these waves. And as you know, electromagnetic spectrum or electromagnetic uh, rays has higher radiations, which might create a lot of disturbances to the existing ecosystem, which can endanger a lot of species and other things. And it's very hazardous to humans as well because of its higher radiation powers. And the other thing is low efficiency. <clears throat> when we talk about efficiency, efficiency is nothing but uh, in a simple words, it's a written of investment or ROI on whatever you say. So for instance, if you send a certain amount of signal and if you receive only a tiny little part of it, then the efficiency of the, say, of the entire uh, product or, FE or is zero or is minute or is less because you're not getting what you're sending. So there is no 100% efficiency in any of the gadgets or any of the principles that we use today. So everything has a certain percent of like flaws or certain percent of disefficiency, you name it. But when we are talking about this um, wireless power transfer through electromagnetic induction, this efficiency is way less. The reason behind this is, as we have seen in the previous slides that we are using electromagnetic spectrum 
as a carrier to carry electricity from one place to other. As this is a part of electromagnetic spectrum, whatever you see in your day-to-day -day life, even now sitting at your home and watching your computers, you have electromagnetic radiation. It's, or you have electromagnetic signals around you. It's not only that your devices or your gadgets produce electromagnetic signals, but even light is a part of electromagnetic spectrum, the one that you are getting from sun. So it has electromagnetic uh, waves. And when you propagate this electricity using electromagnetic waves, what happens is there will be a lot of interference and superimposition of waves that happens through the path. And that's why the efficiency of the signals is very low because of higher attenuation and higher uh, impedance matching. And the other reason is that other drawback for this specific thing is high cost. Imagine like in order to transfer, let us say like two kilowatts of power, you need to have how massive coil for the electromagnetic induction principle. So that's why today, uh, most of the researchers are working on transferring the power using ultrasonic waves. And this is like a trending technology in the research topic areas right now. And MIT is doing a lot of uh, research on this specific uh, ultrasonic wireless power transmission. So let's get on to an overview on how the ultrasonic wireless power transmission looks. So it's basically the same. So even in here, you're transferring the electricity wirelessly without using a physical link or a physical material like a wire or anything. So instead, you can take the power from the AC source and give it to a transducer. This is just an overview though. Um, like uh, we, have, we have a patent filed on this specific thing. So I just don't wanna disclose anything more about it. So that's why I'm just giving you guys an overview on how it can work and what will be the advantages for this. So it's, it's basically when you give the certain amount of electricity to the transducer, as I previously mentioned, the amount of frequency that is developed from the transducer or the piezoelectric material is directly proportional to the voltage or to the power that you supply to the transducer. So let us say, that if I give like 220 volts, these vibrations will be equivalent to the power of 220 volts, which, we, which will be equivalent to, let us say this just number like 40 megahertz or something. And here, what you're doing is you're actually converting electricity, which is a transverse wave into longitudinal waves, into mechanical wave. So as you know, mechanical waves are not a part of electromagnetic spectrum. So once you once you you give your input to the transducer, the transducer creates the ultrasonic waves, and these waves, as they are not a part of electromagnetic spectrum, the attenuation or the superimposition of electromagnetic radiations through through your uh, environment will be less, or there won't be any impact on these because electromagnetic waves won't interfere with ultrasonic waves. But there might be other considerations that we need to keep in mind because, uh, because the, even though these are uh, mechanical waves, their propagation totally depends on the medium that you transfer. So it's vice versa. But when you, when you transfer this, there will be zero radiations that are emitting from this. And in fact, this radiated or propagated ultrasound will hit the receiving transducer, which is again a piezoelectric material, and it converts all the ultrasound into electrical signals or electricity, which can be amplified and can be used for other gadgets. So here is a brief overview on how it can impact. Hospitals and healthcare settings, wireless power creates a cleaner and more hygienic environment where devices and machines can be easily reconfigured. 
Combined power and data solutions further improve the ability for medical practitioners to make accurate diagnoses. Wearable technology and internal devices powered wirelessly will monitor and transmit information of a patient's health, aiding early detection and prevention. Wireless power also provides opportunities to drive greater efficiencies in manufacturing environments. Without the masses of cabling required to power multiple machines and automation, factory lines and sensor networks can be easily reconfigured to adapt to changing volumes and workflows. Significant benefits are also seen in industries where physical connectors are high maintenance. For instance, in marine environments where contactless power transfer provides for robust and repeatable charging of subsea vehicles and sensors. Or, oil drilling and wind turbine applications where wireless offers a reliable and long-lasting solution to supply power to rotating equipment. So this is how an ultrasonic wireless power transmission can benefit across industries. I know like uh, even the ultrasonic waves, as I mentioned to you, like it's not of the appropriate or higher efficiency, but it's very good for us to go for this sort of techniques instead of using the electromagnetic induction principles, which makes our life more easier. Any questions or anything? Hello? Yeah. Sir. Hello, ma'am, madam. Can I continue the session, ma'am? Hello? Yes, sir. Hello, Jayashree. Hello. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Abhishek, sir, for your uh, crystal clear explanation of uh, uh, methods and the generation of ultrasonics and how it is, uh, what are the applications of ultrasonics in industries and also the microwave power transmission, wireless power transmission. So, definitely. Mm -hmm. It will give a good uh, inspiration to all our participants. Uh, it is also a thought provoking to all of us. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, sir we have a few questions. Sure. Shall I ask? Uh, I will ask one or, one or two, sir, from our yeah, chat box. Sure. Shall I, sir? Abhishek, sir? Yeah, yeah sure, ma'am. Go ahead. Okay. Madam, Uma, Uma, Madam. Ah, you can proceed with the uh, chat box. Okay. There are some questions in chat box, A3. Okay. So it is not visible to me. Plus, you can go ahead, then. Sir, that's yeah, sure. Actually, uh, actually, I'll go. I'll go through the chat box. Uh, uh, Kaushik asks, "Can ultrasonics be used to treat tissue inflammation in human body?" Uh, actually, Kaushik, that's a really good question. Uh, yes, obviously, ultrasonics can be used to treat the tissue levels. And basically, when you're talking about the inflammation of a specific tissue, uh, this can be definitely cured with ultrasound. Uh, but the challenging task is, is just to make sure that what's the tissue and to do some physiological properties study of the tissues, then definitely this can be possible. Uh, because actually this ultrasonics can be capable of reducing the inflammations in other uh, like tissues too, because there has been a good research going on. I can refer you to some research material if you're interested. Please shoot me an email or your 
Dropbox so that I can go through and send you some detailed info on those things. And hello. Yeah, ma'am. Go. Hello, sir. Sir, which non-destructive method is superior for finding defects in composite materials like polymer composites, sir? Um. To uh, you mean actually to or uh, to detect the cause in the polymer composites or defects uh, in polymer composite materials. Suppose if we prepare a thin film in with polymer material, mm -hmm. then if we, if we want to study the structural defects, is it possible to adopt any non-destructive method to detect those defects? Yeah, actually, uh, for for polymer studies, there has been a method called as phased array non-destructive testing, uh, which can be used to study the uh, elements in the thin layers of the polymers just to make sure that if there are any cracks or if there are any holes or if there are any deformation of uh, like atoms or molecules in the element, it's possible to do even a microscopic analysis using a non-destructive uh, phased array microscoping technique. Okay. Okay. So one more question yeah. uh, from uh, Dr. D.A. Raji Babu. Sure. What is the level of crosstalk in 52 element ultrasonic probe? Hello? Yeah, uh, yeah, I can see it. Uh, actually, uh, in a 52 element uh, ultrasonic probe that we have uh, that we have manufactured, there is a little bit of crosstalk, uh, which is like interference. But these specific, in order to uh, eliminate that specific thing, what we did is we followed a differentiation technique in sending out the pulses to the 52 element. So these 52 elements normally operate at 15 megahertz range, and each and every element has been tune to a little bit of tolerance so that we can go on reduce the crosstalk on these probe channels. Sir, there is a question from Kaushik. What is the difference between ultrasound and ultrasonics? It's the same. There is specifically no difference. Ultrasound is the sound which is generated used by ultrasonic. And normally take, we call it as ultrasonic waves because we are talking in the wave structure and in the different form. So there is absolutely no difference between ultrasonic and ultrasound. It's just the differentiation that we give when we are representing the terms. And there is a question from Raju, how it is comparable to X-ray NDT? Uh, we, uh, you mean like ultrasonic non-destructive testing? Yes. So one more question. Yeah. Can we use ultrasonics to assess the continuity of composite materials? I mean, composite materials means uh, uh, reinforced plastics and adhesive bondings. Yes. yes, actually we can do that. Uh, we are developing an algorithm to, to see the continuity in the adhesive bond inspection uh, just to in, in inspect whether there is any flaws in that adhesive bonds that we use in attaching or deattaching two substances. It is definitely possible. And for this, uh, we need to follow a linear phased array technique in order to monitor uh, the flaws. One more question. How much voltage is needed for the piezoelectric transducer to excite? Uh, it, as I said before, it, the voltage that you give is directly proportional to the frequency that you need. So if you want to generate, uh, let us say like 15 megahertz of uh, ultrasonic uh, frequency, then you need to give a close approximate to 50 volts. So it all de depends on like what should be the signal strength that you need. Any questions from participants? Hello. So I'll ask only one question, last one. Yeah. Can I? Yeah, sure, go ahead. 
can we use em waves electromagnetic waves for ndt non destructive tests yes absolutely we can use electromagnetic waves for non destructive testing actually electromagnetic waves are predominantly used in non destructive testings before uh, and yes it is possible to do that okay thank you sir no from my side i mean um, to my knowledge a small question for you sir sure sir, is it advantage or disadvantage using this method because there should be a good mechanical coupling between the transducer uh, crystal i mean you call it as probe and mm -hmm. the specimen to be tested is it an advantage or disadvantage that means using uh, ultrasonics method um, I mean, definitely it's an advantage when you're talking about um, i assume you're talking about the attenuation between uh, the transducer and the, the actual specimen right whenever the trans I mean, whenever the ultrasound propagates through the medium, uh, definitely it's advantageous. Uh, and the other thing that I need to mention here is it saves a lot of time and effort in non-destructive testing. And there are certain methods that can be applicable in order to reduce the attenuation uh, or signal uh, distortion that happens from the transducer and enters into the specimen. Thank you, sir. So there is, there is no me. questions from the participant yeah. side. Yes, we one minute. There is a question from P. Venkat Lakshmi. Okay. Is there any method to destroy plastics? Uh, Regard to ultrasonics. Uh, as of as of my knowledge, uh, there are few things that you can use it to destroy ultras uh, to destroy plaque. Plastics, which means actually you can't actually destroy them. You can melt them by sending higher amount of ultrasonic radiations, which is more cost effective. Okay, I see. okay, okay, thank you. Another question is there, sir. Is it possible to break bonds between atoms using ultrasonic? Uh, yes, it is possible to break uh, bonds between uh, the atoms or molecules. But in order to do that, um, you need to have a high intensity directional probe so that it can emit the high intensity in a specified direction in order to break the bonds between the atoms or molecules. Okay, thank you, sir. There is a question from, again, Kaushik. Does mm -hmm. submarines use ultrasonics for communication? Uh, uh, submarines use ultrasonics for sonar, uh, for, communica uh, for communication to the base stations or anything, they won't use ultrasonics. Instead, they use ultrasonics in order to see if there is any obstacles or if there is anything underneath the water. So for communications between a place to place, still we are using RF. There's a question from Aruna Kumari. Is ultrasonics is dangerous to environment? No, absolutely. It is not dangerous to environment. Uh, as I said to you before, these ultrasonic waves are free of radiations, which means electromagnetic radiations, as these are a part of mechanical waves. And uh, there is absolutely no uh, hazard to environment if these are used in the prescribed levels. Anything is hazardous to environment if it if it extends its limit. Okay, thank you, sir. Many of them are asking your mail ID. Can you please? Sure. Hello. Yeah, I'm just typing in my mail ID in the chat box. Okay. Okay. You don't mind there is a question sir yeah <laughs> what is an alternative non-destructive technique for peel off test 
Sorry, I couldn't able to hear you. What is an alternative non-destructive technique for peel off test? Are you hearing? Are you able to hear? Hello. Hello. Are you able yeah. to hear, sir? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. Which, which is an alternative non-destructive technique mm -hmm. for peel off test, P E E L, peel off test. Uh, uh, you mean peel off? Uh, are you talking about uh, weld, or are you talking about the uh, like uh, specimen testing and not in the welding? No, no, specimen testing. Oh, peel off? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you very much, sir, for your patient. My pleasure. No worries. Okay. Thank you very much, Abhishek, sir. My pleasure. And so, I request Mr. J. Radha Krishna, faculty from our department, to propose the vote of thanks. Radha Krishna, sir. Om Namo Venkateshaya. I feel it proud to propose vote of thanks on behalf of our department on this webinar today. At the outset, I thank our resource person, Mr. Abhishek Chakrala, for accepting our invitation and spending his valuable time with us today in spite of his busy schedule. Thank you very much, sir. Your My nice pleasure. and valuable presentation on ultrasonics is highly impressive and informative. And his application in day-to-day -day life definitely inspires each and every participant of today's program. Really, you gave us a very elaborative explanation about ultrasonic wave. That is, how it is generated, the methods to generate ultrasonics, and chiefly, the applications in industries. It is simply awesome, sir. You explained the non-destructive technique method and wireless power transmission in a very good manner. Usually, we teach this non-destructive technique method in material science paper for the sixth semester student. Now you gave a very clear idea about this, which is also useful to our students. I once again, I express our sincere thanks to you, sir. I thank all the participants of their patience in listening to the topic and active participation in questionary session. Thanks to all the participants once again. I extend our sincere thanks to our TTD management, our DEO sir, Dr. Raman Prasad Garu, for permitting us to conduct this webinar. Our sincere thanks to our beloved principal, Dr. K. Mahadevamma Garu, for her constant support in organizing this webinar. She always encourages each and every one of the member of the college in discharging their duties. Thank you very much, ma'am. Last but not least, I express our sincere thanks to our smart and dynamic ma'am, our HOD, Dr. C. Uma Devi, for her endeavor in organizing this webinar in a sequential way. Actually, she is the backbone of our department. Thank you very much, ma'am. I thank all the faculty of the department, Dr. Y. Jayasri, Dr. D. Uma Maheshwari, and Dr. G. Lakshmi Sandhya for their constant cooperation in conducting this webinar in a successful way. It goes without saying that a very big thanks to Mr. Subramanian Garu, our technical advisor, without whom it would not be possible for us to organize this webinar smoothly today without any technical disturbance. Thank you very much, Subramanian Garu. Thanks to one and all. Namaste. Dehen. Over to Jaisri Madam. Thank you, Radha Krishna. Jayashree, uh, I request all the participants uh, to open your videos, video and audio, please. We'll uh, leave this session with a national anthem. Photo, Jayashree, ask the participants to open the video for uh, photograph session. Right. Please, all of all, I request all the participants to open video and audio, please. Thank <laughs> you. 
Subramaniam sir? Hello? Subramaniam sir? We'll close this session with national anthem. Okay, okay. Just take a screenshot, madam. I'm taking a screenshot. Okay. Subramaniam sir? Ma'am, I'm taking a screenshot. Okay, okay. Meanwhile, many of the participants are asking about feedback, sir. You just tell. Yeah, we will send it, ma'am. Okay. Already it's in the flyer. Okay, sir. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Shall we proceed for the national anthem, ma'am? Yes, sir. मन अधिनायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविड उत्कल बंगा बिंद हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्चल जल धितरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे शुभ आशीष मांगे गाहे तब जय गाधा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, all of you. Thank you very much.